Hi. So I just got back from trekking in the Sahara Desert for the last week. So you guys definitely should have more energy than I do. So we we'll try one more time. Hi. Wow, way better. It felt better, didn't it? Great to be with you guys. It's really an honor to be here, and I want to acknowledge every single one of you guys, because I know it takes something. I know it takes something to be in a conversation about what's possible, a conversation about innovation, and leave your families, leave your businesses, type your emails on a smaller screen, to be here. So let's give everybody here a round of applause. I also want to thank Sonia, one-to-one -one Monaco, and the entire team that put this thing on, because I think we know what it takes to put on an event such as this. And we've got an incredible couple of days planned, and so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> if you can't tell yet, I love clapping. Now, I wanted to kick us off with a video to lay the foundation not only for this keynote, but for the entirety of this conference. And you could even look at it as laying the foundation for where you're headed in your career and in your retail business. You guys ready? OK, great. Right now, we are experiencing the highest rate of change in history. And your potential has never been greater. The catch is, it takes something to do things differently, to break the patterns of history and the patterns of yourself, to go about life and business in a new way. As retailers, as humans, the overwhelm of innovation walls us into an action. Each new technology we look at can yield literally millions of different versions of your potential. And if we have to sit up and engage them, how do we know which to choose? Well, we've spent decades working with brands, working with retailers, working with innovation, not just to create a news flash or a press release, but to give them access to developing a culture of innovation, the ability to pivot, adjust, and change to where the opportunities are. And today, today it's your turn. Today we're going to start that process with you so you can turn your retail operation into something that serves your customers, your employees, and yourself in entirely new ways. Okay, so if you're with me now, clap once. If you're with me, oh, we, can, we, can, we can give it a round of applause too. But let's, let's try that again. If you're with me, clap once. If you're with me, clap twice. OK, great. So let's have some fun today, yeah? You guys game for that? So I, I thought we could start off by playing a little game. Because retail, innovation in retail, can be very sexy, right? The robots, the 3D printing, the IoT. Especially if you're reading it in a magazine, maybe hearing about it on stage. Maybe even in a strategy planning session. But when it comes to how we embrace innovation, when it comes to us actually changing, it feels a little bit different. So here's how the game's going to go. You just have to pay attention to two things. The first is watch what that little voice in your head is saying. If it's asking why I'm being quiet for so long, it's that voice. If it's saying something like, oh no, now one of these speakers, it's that voice. Okay, everybody got it? Yes? Okay. Now the second thing is pay attention to your mood. Are you happy? Sad, angry, annoyed? Super excited? Okay. Now watch those two things. You ready? Okay, the first step in this game is everybody stand up.
Okay, great. Now, watch the voice. What did the voice say? Oh, my God, I can't believe we have to do this. <laughs> and how's your mood? Are you a little annoyed? Maybe you're happy. Maybe you said, hey, this is great. I've been sitting on an airplane all morning, and now I get to stand up. All right, next step is put your hands up. <laughs> Some laughing, a couple smiles, a couple frowns. You guys over here, come on. <laughs> now, what's, what's the voice saying now? My fingers are getting a little numb. How's your mood? Okay, put your arms down. Have a seat. Thank you guys for playing along. Now, here's what that is. That's literally a mirror, right? We just held up a mirror so you could see yourself with how you engage with innovation, how you engage with change. Because usually, it comes about as something that we have to do differently, right? When you came in here this morning, this afternoon, you said, oh, well, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to listen to some keynotes. Then we're going to go have lunch. I really just can't wait for lunch. And all we did is we threw in a little bit of a, an innovation, a little bit of a change. And so you get to see how you respond to that. And none of it's bad. None of it's wrong, right? However you responded is perfect. The point is, is that you can pay attention that you can see it. Because the pace of change is only accelerating from here, whether we like it or not, right? I mean, today, right here, right now, is the slowest pace of change we will ever see again in our entire lives. We live in a world today where drones are delivering products, purchases happening in virtual reality, and we're talking to robots and bots. And if you ask me, I tell you I've got one of the greatest jobs in the world. Because I get to spend time with folks like yourselves, meet with some of the greatest minds of our day, and especially lately, play with some really cool technology. And I'm working with most of the major retailers and brands out there to be in a conversation about what's possible. How is this innovation going to disrupt or enhance the businesses that we're already in? So we're going to do that today. We're going to do three things today. First, we're going to talk about how the power has shifted within the retail supply chain. And hint, the power is not with us as the industry anymore. We're then going to get into something I call innovation thinking, or how to develop a culture of change, a team of people that can embrace whatever change is coming up, whether you have to stand up as the audience or embrace a new technology in your business. And finally, we're going to get into some real case studies of technologies that have changed how retailers have gone to market and what that customer experience actually is. The key to these things is that they're both technologically workable, right? They're technologies that work, but they're also economically viable, something I call leading without bleeding. We're going to do it all in about 45 minutes, so we've got time for questions. How's that sound? Good? Okay, great. Now, I grew up as a fifth-generation retailer. In fact, this is how my family store got started as a roadside produce stand started back in 1934, and I grew up here. It was really great to grow up in a grocery store, at least until I turned 15 and I started having to work night crew and everything else. But when I was a kid, and you can think back to when you were a kid, retail used to be a little bit different, didn't it? Like, I remember we knew our customers, like really knew them. Their likes, their dislikes, what they might like. We knew their families. I even remember, oftentimes, if good customers couldn't make it in a certain day, we'd grab the groceries that they needed, throw them in the back of our station wagon, and drop them off at their house on our way home. And that was before delivery was a thing, because, you know, delivery is a thing now, right? Well, as a store, and I would assert as an industry, we started to lose track of the individual customer. It became more about mass, 
more about volume, more about how many products we could sell through our front door or through the online portals. And loyalty helped, right? Customer data helps. My family's store was one of the first stores in the US at least to launch loyalty back in the early 90s. It's also what led us to become kind of a future store. We started bringing in all these different technologies from biometrics to in-store displays to augmented and virtual reality to the point where today I'm looking at over a thousand new retail technology companies every single year. And that's just a fraction of what's out there, right? It's also what led to speaking, which if you can't tell, is like my favorite thing in the world to do. I got to tell you this quick story. This is uh, yeah, probably 15, 20 years ago. I was invited to speak for Mitsubishi in Tokyo, Japan. And they had me set up in the largest conference room in the Mitsubishi Conference Center. It was about 500 people, so a little bit bigger than this, but it was the largest crowd I'd spoken to up until that point, so I was a little bit nervous. And so I prepared meticulously. And so I get up on the stage and I look out at the audience and it's all men, it's all Japanese men in what looks like the same gray suit, white shirt, red tie, and they're all smoking. There's so much smoke in the room, you can't even see back, it's kind of like looking out into a foggy day. And I deliver my first couple of lines. Translator starts right on cue. I know you're surprised I don't speak Japanese. 30 seconds go by, 60 seconds go by, 90 seconds go by, which is an eternity if you don't know what's going on up here, right? Two minutes later, the entire audience breaks out laughing. I didn't tell a joke. <laughs> so I stumble through the rest of this thing, and I find the translator afterwards. His name was Mr. Numata, and I say, Mr. Numata, what did you say out there? Why was everybody laughing? And he said, ah, oh, I told him you were here talking about the future of commerce and innovation, and well, you were really here to find a Japanese wife. It's a true story. Now, it's funny, but I learned two very important things that day. The first is, well, if you're looking for a date in Japan, Mr. Numan is your guy, right? He's still over there, he's still working. The second is foundational to everything that we've done since and should be foundational to everything that you are doing, which is if you want to have the desired impact on your customer, well, you would better be speaking their language. And today, that is more important than ever before in history. Because modern retailing was started somewhere around 1930s, 1940s where merchants had this incredible innovation of the time, this big breakthrough, where they found out, oh, when customers come in, I don't have to personally serve them. I can just put the products on the shelf and have customers come in and get them. And just like that, bam, modern retailing's born. And we've done some things since then, right? This is not an exhaustive list by any means. But we introduced scanning somewhere around the mid-70s, self-checkout in the early 90s, loyalty mid-90s, Amazon and eBay and others. We started to go online in 95 or so. But somewhere with the iPhone or around the iPhone, things changed. Where consumers started taking the position of, well, I'm on mobile, and if you want to do business with me, you've got to be on mobile too. Or it could be, well, I've got so many options today. The option I want is the one that's most relevant to me. And if you're going to do business with me, you need to be relevant in terms of offers, in terms of content. And this same thing is what will sound like. I'm in virtual reality. I have an Internet of Things connected home. And if you want to do business with me, You've got to be there, too. Because we all know the language consumers are speaking is digital. And 
These aren't surprising numbers to you guys. We don't need to dwell on these, right? More than half the world is online. Although I just learned uh, two days ago that a population roughly 15 times the size of Monaco goes online every single day. That's how fast that's growing. And of course, most of them are coming online by mobile. 68% of internet users are mobile. And well, one of the reasons we're all here is that 40% of people that have ever been on the internet have purchased something. Now, these are general numbers. And like I said, you know these numbers. But it's in the specific, right? It's stepping back from the generality and getting into the specific of how fast these changes are happening that you start to see, wow, the world has transformed in just a couple of years, so much so that it has become the new status quo. If we just look at a couple examples here, Uber, back in 2014, hit this incredible milestone. They went out to dinner, they were popping champagne, they had one million riders total that have ever gone on the platform. That's an incredible accomplishment. Five years later, 15 million riders per day. Per day. Five years that happened. Take WeChat Pay. WeChat if you don't know, it's a messaging platform founded out of China, very popular there and some other uh, areas in the region. They founded a payment platform inside of the chat platform in 2013. It did not exist prior to that. And then all of a sudden, today, one billion monthly active users. A couple of years. And finally, I'm sure you all are familiar with the Echo the smart speaker home of Amazon's artificial intelligence, Alexa. It was not a thing in 2014. Nobody was talking about smart speakers. Nobody even knew what a smart speaker was. 100 million of them as of January, give or take, in the market, right? So the pace of change is extraordinarily fast, and the consumer's language is engaging with these new technologies faster and faster. So you think, we live in a, a pretty incredible retail world, must be. I'm from California. Well, New York originally, and all my friends from New York make fun of me now because I'm into yoga and juicing. You guys know the cliche California thing, yes? Yeah, yeah, I'm into all of it, by the way, except surfing. I'm a terrible surfer. So this is my homage to yoga here, what kind of aligns mind, body, and spirit. I think of it very similarly in retail. Well, you know, we've got these incredible technologies. We've got really great customers, and we've got our business. We can bring these three things together to create an entirely new consumer experience, right? So retail must be incredible today. <laughs> Does this look familiar to anybody? US, Europe, Asia. Retail has not fundamentally changed in the better part of a hundred years. I'm not saying there's not exceptions, but this simply doesn't work anymore. This is the proof. Last year, more stores closed than ever before in history. And I've had lunch, lately more drinks with a lot of these executives. And they used to explain away their lack of performance as, oh, well, Sterling, it's really just our merchandising strategy was a little bit off, or our pricing strategy could have been different, or uh, we didn't have a great holiday season, but otherwise our business is fine. But in the last 18 months, really more so in the last 12 months, when we sit down and we have a drink, it's, yeah, we've hit a brick wall. A brick wall with Amazon painted on the side of it. A company, by the way, responsible for 53% of all e-commerce growth. And it's really easy looking at those kinds of numbers, the store closings, how big Amazon's gotten, what's happening in the online. Well, who needs stores anymore, right? But the thing is, we've spent the better part of a hundred years 
putting stores specifically around people that buy stuff. It's not the stores that are the problem. It's how the stores are coming together with technology to create a new customer experience. And here's the proof. More stores opened last year than ever before in history. So we have this dichotomy of at the same time, in the same year, more stores are closing than ever before and more stores are opening than ever before. Why? Right? How come some stores are closing their doors, struggling to keep them open, and others are blowing the doors off? Well, it has to do with our business culture. And it has to do with our thinking. About a month ago, I was having a dinner with the CEO of one of the largest retail chains in California. And we're talking about 2019 planning where we're going, what technologies they're using, what's piloting. But the conversation sounded like this. Well, we did X amount in sales last year, and we're going to do about 3% better this year. And we're going to save about 2% efficiencies within our supply chain, so we're going to save a little bit of money. Now, no problem with that conversation, okay? We have to have those kinds of conversations, not just as businesses, but as people, right? But what he's doing, and what we tend to do is we tend to orient ourselves into the past, where we're looking into the past for what can we fix, what can we adjust, what can we change? And the best, like literally the best you're gonna end up with if this is all you're doing is a slightly better version of something that you already have. So globally, we look at the majority of retailers out there, not so sure if they're gonna use more in enhanced data platforms. Questioning how much they're going to use mobile. Maybe they don't even have a mobile strategy today. And we're left spending 80%, give or take, of our technology budgets on technology that we already have in place. Now, from where I stand, I see this as our job, like our mission, like no kidding, to transform commerce into a low friction, easily accessible, highly personalized, customer-centric experience that I know we know is possible, right? Yes? You guys know it's possible, yes? Yeah. So if we're not just looking into the past, we're not just looking for linear and incremental growth, what else is there? Well, there is something else. Who here has heard how chess was invented? Couple people? Yeah. Okay. So keep me honest with the story, yeah? How the story goes is the emperor of China was bored many years ago, and he did what bored emperors did back then. He called in a local game merchant and he said to him, Come up with a game for me, a game that I will never get bored with. And the game merchant, not able to refuse the emperor, of course, went away, and I don't know if it was days, weeks, months, however long he was toiling in his workshop, and he comes up with the game chess. Can you imagine having come up with that, by the way? Especially if he had a patent on it? He runs back to the palace, and he shows the emperor. And the emperor says, this is the greatest game. How can I ever repay you? And the game merchant thinks for a moment. He says, well, you'll pay me in rice, because... That's how they were paying people back then. And we'll take the chessboard. And on the first square of the chessboard, we'll put one grain of rice, and for every square thereafter, we'll double it. Sounds reasonable to me. The emperor said, of course, let's do it. So they shake hands, they high five, they sign the agreement, they finalize it however they finalize it, and they go about adding up the rice. Now, the first half of the chessboard Relatively uneventful. Adds up to like a large field of rice. It's the second half of the chessboard where things get interesting. Square after square, it's adding up. By the last square, it adds up to over 18 million 
trillion grains of rice, which at 10 grains of rice per square inch, it's enough rice to cover the entire surface of the Earth, including the oceans, twice. Now, I told you that story to tell you this, which is the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. We all know what the graph looks like. We all understand the theory and maybe even the mathematics behind it, but when it comes to how fast or what it's going to be like when it comes to our business, not to mention our lives, it's a totally different story and all emerging technologies are on this exponential growth curve. Let's just take computer processing. A few years back, a $1,000 1,000 US dollar computer processor would buy you the processing power equivalent of an insect brain. You get that? Processing power equivalent of an insect brain. Around now, that same 1,000 US dollars buys you the processing power of a mouse brain, and in a few years, a human brain for 1,000 US dollars. Now that's something in its own right, but where it goes next is mind-blowing, right? By 2045, which is not all that long from now, a thousand US dollar processor buys you the processing power of all human beings alive. There'll be about nine billion people by then for a thousand US dollars. Now, you know that story. It's kind of a cool story. You can share it with your friends, your coworkers, right? But when it comes to how that's going to impact our businesses, right? When in our cell phones or implanted in our glasses or in our arm or in our eye, wherever that computer processing is, it's literally unfathomable to understand how that's going to impact our day-to-day -day operations. And when these technologies, these emerging technologies combine, so take something like 3D printing and wearables, or uh, artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. When these things come together, it creates entirely new product categories, driving innovation even further and even faster. So if we take these two things, if we take the incremental growth that most of us maybe don't like but accept, right? We're going to do 5% better this year, 10% bigger. We're going to save 2% within our supply chain. If we take that incremental growth and we lay on top of it the exponential growth of what's possible, well, there's a gap. It's called the innovation gap. And it's inside of this gap that we can actually step. It's cool, right? Yes? Yeah, sure. But the question is then, well, how? That sounds great, Sterling, really interesting, but how do we actually do that? Any ideas? You're lucky on this one because you got it. The first step is you have to listen for something new as possible. Listen for something new as possible. Now, here's a trap, though. I'm speaking English. And whether you understand the English I'm speaking or it's translated into French, you understand the words that I'm saying. You've been in your business for some period of time. You know something about your business. And I'd say you probably have heard about all these technology companies, all these emerging tools that are coming into market that are going to transform the whole world, right? You've, you've heard about them a couple of times but it's discovering something new. Like literally discovering something new inside of the things that we already know that we can see something new as possible, not as a theory, but something that we can actually take action on. So let me, do you mind if I use you as a quick example? Can you come up here for a second? I know, I should have told you I was going to do this. Yeah, just stand here for a second. All right, so watch. This is a water bottle. 
Here, put that down, because I need you to catch this. <laughs> okay, I'm going to toss it to you, yeah? Now, you catch it. Why did you catch it? Well, it, it was the obvious thing to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, we got to get that thing turned on. Just hang on one second. So it was the obvious thing to do to catch the water bottle. It was the obvious action to take. Now, that's your current work streams, right? This is things that you're already doing. Ah, oh, we're going to improve our social media. We're going to increase our click rank on Google. Hang on one second. <laughs> the, the joys of translation, right? Now, the work streams you're already doing, you're obviously doing them because it occurs as an obvious thing for you to do. We need to do those things. Now, one more thing. It's going to be easy, I promise. Ready? So why didn't you catch it? Well, it's, it, it was obviously not thrown at you, right? It's the obvious thing to do not to catch it. You can have a seat. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause, by the way. Thank you. It was the obvious thing to do not to catch this. And if you get this, you get what I spend literally thousands of hours working with executives on, okay? It's so simple, it's easy to miss. But when the water bottle's on the floor, this is your emerging technologies. This is your artificial intelligence. This is your 3D printing. This is your internet of things, right? You see it, but the obvious thing to do is nothing. I see it over there. So now, let's just imagine a couple of new actions, right? So if we moved the water bottle a little bit closer, it would look a little more catchable, wouldn't it? You probably wouldn't do anything about it, but it'd be a little more catchable. And if we take another action, maybe we, we swap out the water bottle for a baseball. Well, then it's a little more obvious to catch it. And if we take this whole thing and we put it out on a baseball field, and we put you in a baseball uniform, what's the obvious thing to do then? Catch it. Not only do you think you should catch it, but everybody here would kind of expect you to catch it, because that's the obvious action to take. And so how this works is you listen for something new as possible, and then you actually take actions towards it. And this is kind of at a macro level. Right? You see something new as possible. It might be somebody on the show floor today. You see an artificial intelligence tool, an IoT, a conversational commerce. Right? But the trick is, the meaningful step is, is to take a new action as a result of it. Because after every new action, you're going to see something new as possible. And step after step in this staircase, we can climb. To not just look into the past, to not just look for how things have been done already or how we already run our business, but we can take steps towards what's possible in terms of a new customer experience. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Because innovation is not about technology. It's not. It is a factor of one thing and one thing only our thinking, our thinking. What do we see as possible for ourselves? I'll give you a couple examples because it's easy to get lost in the flurry of emerging technologies out there because there's lots of them, right? There's this current of new technology, but it doesn't always have to be the latest, greatest, groundbreaking thing because it took 50 years to go from the picture to the motion picture. Not a huge technological leap, but half a century to put those things together. My favorite example, and maybe the best example, is that Xerox invented the personal computer 20 years before Steve Jobs literally thought differently about it. 20 years. 
He took an existing technology that already worked, and he created an entirely new application for it. He created something new, and if you don't know this, it's mind-blowing. Xerox didn't even patent it. And finally, when I was a kid, I used to love remote control vehicles. I loved playing with them. Didn't matter if they flew or they floated or they drove. They were the greatest. And I still get to play with these things, but we don't call them remote control vehicles anymore. What do we call them? Drones, exactly. And they're delivering products and carrying out military duty. Now, the trick is to bring this culture, this idea, into our own organizations, right? Because if it's not about the technology, and it's only about our thinking, it's the cultures that we build and the kinds of conversations that we're having inside of our business that are going to make the difference. So the key to this whole thing, for better or worse, is you. It's you seeing something new as possible and then actually taking new actions on it and then sharing those actions amongst your colleagues, with your families, with your friends, sharing what's now possible, what you've now created inside of your business to create something new. And as you take those steps, it becomes institutionalized within your business. And you can look at a couple of great case studies here, right? We already talked about Steve Jobs and how Think Different was not just a marketing campaign. It wasn't something just to throw on the signs. It was literally who they were as a company. Who Apple was, was the kinds of people, not just Steve Jobs, but all of them, that thought differently to create a new experience. No surprise they disrupted so many different industries. Amazon. I was up at their offices it was a couple of months ago now, but they've got this, <laughs> this great motto. Everybody okay? <laughs> I know it's exciting. I don't know if it's that exciting. <laughs> They've got this great model of day one. So whether it really is your first day, or you've been there for a decade or longer, it's always, you walk in there with the mindset of it's your first day. Do you remember how you were on your first day in the office? Or your first day starting the company? You're open, right? You're discovering what's new. You're figuring out how things work. You're asking a lot of questions. You're looking for new things. So these companies, and what there is to do with you, is to create a culture of innovation by literally asking those questions, by thinking different yourselves, by taking new actions to develop the team of people that's going to adapt to whatever the next technology is going to be. Because I guarantee you next year, it's going to be some hot new thing, and the year after that, it'll be something else, right? So the key to this, the key to unlocking all of it, is developing your organization as a group of people that can adapt to change. Now, as you might expect, I get asked a lot, well, Sterling, what does the future of commerce actually look like? What are the kinds of technologies that are going to be out there? And I always tell them the same story, the story of two fish. Now, the story goes, it's a beautiful day out, not unlike today. And there's a man at a park. There's green grass, a bench, trees. And there's a pond. And the guy gets up and he walks down to the pond, and there's two fish in it. And this, this is a world where fish can talk, by the way, so just bear with me. He says to one of the fish, how's the water? And the fish answers him and says, oh, the water's great. And the man walks away, and the second fish looks at the first fish and says, what's water? Now think about that for a second. To a fish, water is everything. So much so of everything that it's indistinguishable from anything and everything else around it. And that's what the future of commerce is going to look like. Where commerce transacting is so embedded into everything that we're doing, into our homes, into our cars, into retail stores, 
where it's so embedded into our everyday life that it becomes indistinguishable from anything else around it. I think about my niece. I've got two nieces. And the older one's two and a half, and it was really funny when my brother told me he was having a baby, because I was like, oh yeah, great, I'm gonna love her, it'll be my niece. And she was born, I was like, oh, I really love her. And I'm getting out to see him all the time, and she's going to grow up in a world where she may never have a plastic credit card. She may never drive. She may never actually have to wait in the line to check out of a store because these things are going to be so embedded into her holistic experience, into her customer experience, she doesn't have to think twice about them. But there's three guiding principles that we should look to when we look at, well, what does the future of commerce look like? Things that are perceptive, things that are predictive, and things that are present. Now, as I promised, I've got some case studies here, but let's do it a little bit differently. Instead of just going through some of the hard numbers, let's walk through, well, what does a day in the life as a customer actually feel like? What does it look like if you put all these future things together and go through a day with it? Let's just take a day in my life. Now, I'm, I'm not a morning person. Are you guys morning people? No. Nobody's, there's like four people that are morning people. I like coffee in the morning. So I wake up and I say, Alexa, get me a coffee. And she answers me, of course, and says, oh, would you like it delivered? Obviously. Now, what I'm engaging with is something you're all, I'm sure, familiar with called conversational commerce. And it's been in the news a lot lately because, well, people aren't buying as many things as they're supposed to or was expected from this tool. But that's not the point. You see, when we have an intelligence that's capable of interacting effectively with customers, there's a whole list of things we can do. There's one company out of Texas that's developed a private label Alexa system. And they've been working with one of the largest airlines in the world and one of the largest insurance companies in the world. And they didn't worry about sales. They said, well, let's plug it into customer service. So they plugged it into customer service, and for the cost of about one employee, it effectively handled 80% of customer service inquiries. 80% overnight for the cost of one employee. Wow! Now, I'm not a mathematician, but you got to think, well, that's going to free up some money, maybe some people, maybe some resources. We can redeploy that to understand, well, how come so many people are calling customer service to begin with? Right? 80% savings there. Now, back to my day of the life, I, I get a text message, your coffee's arrived, it's from Starbucks, it's what you always order, and it's not a person at the door, it's a robot. Now, robots have been in the supply chain for many years now. The big thing when it comes to warehouse robotics, though, are these piece-picking robotics, where they can literally pick e-commerce orders, 100% robotically. There's also robots in stores carrying out really basic customer service, but also looking for out of stocks. What I'm talking about here is the last mile robotics. And there's robots that take to the sidewalks, and there's autonomous vehicles that take to the streets. These are in London. These are in Washington, D.C. These are in San Francisco. And in working with one of the pilots, a grocery company piloted one of the robots that delivers on the sidewalks. It's got a radius of, I think, about three miles it can deliver to. Using the robot to deliver, not only, this is the funny part, not only would customers be willing to pay more for that delivery, something that I don't think is long-lived, by the way. It's just a fun thing now. 
but they saved 90% in their delivery costs. 90%. So we hear numbers like 80% of customer service handled by artificial intelligence. 90% of our delivery costs is now eliminated because of robotics. It creates a hugely disruptive, transformative experience for, well, how does retail have to work now? And I say have to because if you've got savings like this, it becomes a necessity for every one of your competitors. So I've got my coffee, I did my yoga, I took a shower, I'm ready to leave the house, and the worst thing that could possibly happen to me happens. You know what? I'm out of toilet paper. You guys have been there. I'm talking about the quick button. In Amazon, discontinued their quick button, uh, I think it was just in February of this past year. Not because it didn't work, but because they've started integrating intelligence into all of our home, into the washer, the dryer, the dishwasher. There's a company I've worked with called Quick, and they have a pilot with SodaStream. You guys know SodaStream, right? The carbonated beverages? Yes? Yeah. Now, their buttons, not only could you press and reorder, but you attach them to the soda stream, and it was smart enough to know when you needed new CO2 cartridges so you didn't have to do anything. And overnight, a 20% increase in sales. Overnight. Now, the point of this is not these buttons. It's exactly where Amazon's headed, right? where these technologies are being embedded in our phones, in our cars, in our homes. And what that does is it removes entire product categories out of the traditional retail market, out of the online retail market, right? Just like we were talking about with my niece and the fish and water, it becomes integrated into what's already happening. So, I've got the toilet paper, it's coming this afternoon, I pop into a shop, and this isn't just a regular retail store. This store has augmented reality inside of their mobile app. And it's not just for the sake of augmented reality, because I'm 100% in agreement with the conversation here. Technology for the sake of technology doesn't work. But if it adds value to the customer experience, well now we're onto something. And when you look at augmented reality, 65% of shoppers, 65% expect AR and VR will change the way they shop. And so when this particular retailer gave it to them, in a three-month pilot, they turned it into a bit of a gaming platform, a treasure hunt within their stores. 80% of customers redeem the coupons and the rewards that they got throughout the platform. 80% redemption rates. This is in a world where coupons are, you know, one, two, five percent if you're really good. 80% of these things actually got redeemed. And finally, after I've got what I'm gonna buy, I can now just walk out, right? You guys have seen the Amazon Go store. There's probably 10 similar technology companies that I've seen come into market. And one of them here looks to save 55% increase in profit margins. Now, I, I think most of you probably can remember, but remember when we started to move into people using credit cards and all of a sudden they spent more? They spent more because it didn't feel like they were spending money. I've been to some of these stores. How many of you guys have been to these stores? A couple people? Yeah, of course you have. <laughs> I, I've been to several of them, and every time I feel like I'm stealing. So what do you think happens when people no longer have to pull out their wallet and pay for something? Not only is it a much better customer experience, and you save a bunch of money because you don't need the front end and all the labor, but customers are spending more as well. So if you take anything from this presentation, take this. If you've seen something new as possible for your business, 
maybe for yourself personally? Take a new action on it. Do something newly. Pilot it. Implement it. Try it out. Bring them into your office because these innovations can only happen inside of your conversations. And then share what's possible. And the more you do these things, the more you climb that staircase, we start to let go of what retail in your business already is. And we start to see the possibility and realize the possibility of what it can become. So remember that story I told you in the beginning of what retail used to be like, where we knew our customers, we knew their families? Well, the future of retail, the future of commerce is a return to that kind of retailing but happening at scale with the use of technology. So if we abide by these main principles, right? Things that are perceptive, they're predictive, and they're present. Customers are ready, and they're willing, and they're excited to engage. And from where I stand, I can't wait to step into that future of commerce, to create the future of commerce with all of you. Now, I think we've got time for about 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll get you out to lunch. So, do we have the microphones? We can turn down the music. Oh, thank you. So are there any questions, or should we just get out to lunch? What do you think? I might need them translated, depending on who they're coming from. Did you have a question? No. Please, uh, actually, we'll get you the microphone here. Hi, in the film you showed at the beginning, yeah. there was a lot of uh, VR and AR. Uh, I don't know how it is in the U.S., but yeah. here it looks like something not very convenient for retail yeah. and that people wouldn't really engage with. Mm -hmm. Is it really going to happen? Uh, I think the better place to look is not virtual reality. I got one of the Oculus Go's, by the way, and I loved it. But I used it for the first week and I stopped using it. I haven't used it since. Right? I think augmented reality certainly has a play, and where the play is initially is with a lot of the larger retail goods, right? The rugs, the home furnishings, the appliances, to understand how is that going to fit in your home or wherever you're placing these things to engage with them. So you see companies like Ikea really effectively using augmented reality. And we also had the case study towards the end here of the, it's kind of like an independent retail shop focused on skateboarding and sneakers and these kinds of things. And they included augmented reality in their app. And I don't remember the exact percentage of customers that use them, but it was so engaging that 80% of the people actually redeemed the offers that they got. And so how I would answer that, well, that's how I would answer it kind of at a macro level. But for your business, right? because that's what I'm more interested in, the specifics of your business and how you're looking at it, is does it add meaningful value to the customer experience? Just having augmented or virtual reality for the sake of having it, no good. I would never recommend that to anybody. If you want to play with it, buy an Oculus Go, right? But if there are applications such as Tilly's found with the loyalty, or such as Ikea has with placing these things in the home, then I think, it's worthwhile pursuing. Yeah. I don't know how you guys want to manage this. This is the first hand I saw. Um, how do you manage the disruption in your customers between those which are millenniums and can uh, uh, afford and use those technologies and the other one? How do, you, how do you see the, 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 the fracture between 
all your customers because you have no, not one customer, one sort of customer only. Yeah. You have a whole different customer which has different experiences with the digital. How do you see that in the future? Ah, I, I see. So you, you've got different demographics maybe represented. Yes. Right? And not all of them are ready for technology? Of course. Got it. Yeah. So the, the question is, is what? How do we handle that? Yeah. Well, again, it depends on the specifics of your business. And I, I'm not trying to duck the question, but that's really where the answer lies. And broadly, I would say, yeah, you don't want to alienate any of your customers, but you do want to stand for something. Right? You want to stand for something in terms of what the customer experience is going to be. How can you add value to the customer experience? And when you stand there, you'll naturally start to attract the kinds of customers that are engaging or going to engage with the experience that you create. Now, how you transition might take some steps, right? And I, I would say I'm more interested in how the company culture shifts than how the customer base engages. Because as you can develop this company culture as a group of people that can add value to the customer base, well, then you start to get specific answers to your question, right? Where some technologies might make sense and others don't. Or it might make sense for your existing business, but maybe you need to start or pilot something else over here to create something new. Right? And I do see a lot of companies doing that fairly effectively of having kind of a skunk works or a gorilla works of trying out new technologies that one, they can bring back into their existing business if it makes sense for that business, for that customer base. Or second, spinning out new companies to deliver that new experience when it's inconsistent with the current company. Thank you. We've got time for one more. I saw a hand up over here before. Did I make that up? All right, last one. Uh, you talk a lot about like this uh, auto refill machine that you can predict what the customer will need, like the soda stream machine. Yeah. The thing is, I understand that for the customer it's a good thing. You don't have to think about it. It's better for the predictive thing of the business. The thing is, uh, how do we not threatening the customer to say that uh, we're not a big brother company controlling his life? Yeah. How do we fix the border to have the good image and not the bad one? I got it. So it's interesting because privacy in, in Big Brother is cultural and it changes over time. See, if you were to tell people 20 years ago, oh, you're going to post all your family pictures and what you had for dinner and who your friends are and where you're going on vacation on social media so everybody else in the world can see it, they'd think you were crazy, wouldn't they? Yeah, nobody would do that 20 years ago. And yet today, it's become the norm. And it's the same thing when we look at some of these smart devices in home, is we are just starting, so there, there's gotta be some room, some allowance for a customer shift to let them understand how this works. But ultimately, it's a value exchange, right? Yes, I think we should market it and make sure it's friendly and you know, we're not big brother, but we're actually delivering value. But at the end of the day, the question is not, should we do it, should we not, are we big brother, are we not? It's, is that consumer experience, that customer experience that we're making, valuable enough for the privacy or big brother positioning that we're giving up. And yeah, that shifts over time, but if the experience or the value I get as a customer outweighs the privacy or big brother I have to give up, then as a consumer, I'm obviously going to adopt it. Yeah. So I'll be around for the rest of the day. I'm going to be at the party tonight. I will see you guys at lunch for upstairs. You've been great. Thank you very much.